Hey guys, Matt Scott here from Overland Journal and Adventure Imports. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, I guess, one of my one of my pride and joy vehicles, my Land Cruiser 80 Series. Um, I guess one of the first things you're going to notice, steering wheel's on the wrong side. Um, this is actually an HDJ81. This came from Japan, um, imported through Steve over at Land Cruisers Direct, who was great to deal with on it. Um, the 80 Series is a pretty interesting vehicle in my book. It's the last Land Cruiser we got in the United States with a solid axle. It's available with a huge variety of engine options, gearbox options, factory lockers. This thing even has a factory um, refrigerated little ice maker and center console, which is quite cool. But the 80 has always been, a, I, I guess, a sentimental vehicle to me. My first, my first Overland vehicle was a Land Rover Discovery. Um, and I always kind of joked that I got a Land Rover because I couldn't afford a Jeep or a Land Cruiser. And as I started to get a little bit older and I was in school, I got the world's worst 80 series. It had holes in the floor. It had an exhaust that I would probably fix about every week from Farm and Fleet with little contraptions and things. It was just horrible. I ended up trading it for like a crotch rocket in January because that was really smart. And I was like 12 or something. But um, this vehicle this 80 for me was kind of retribution to the land cruiser it was taking everything that i had learned working in the industry working with overland journal working with max tracks traveling extensively in land cruisers and trying to put together something that was um you know focused on travel so it doesn't have huge bumpers it doesn't have rock sliders i invested the weight into fuel i invested the weight into Shieldman seats. Actually, I think that probably saved me some weight, but um, you'll also notice the roof looks a little bit different. It's got a pop top from Mulgo, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, these things of, you know, these Land Cruisers, they're, uh, they're just dependable. This is like, you know, the family dog, I guess, for us. And so importing an 80 series is a, a little bit of an interesting thing. Um, I get a lot of questions well, why didn't you do a 70? The 70 is the one we couldn't get here. The 70 is the one that everybody loves. It's the international overland vehicle of choice. Um, but for me, I had actually, about a year or two previous to, to importing this, um, I already had had a 70 when I lived in Australia. So I had already had that experience. Um, and not to say anything against them, I, I guess I just felt that the 80 was, well, it's, it's more comfortable. It's available with the one HDT in this year, which is the Toyota factory turbo diesel. Um, it's available with an automatic transmission. You get a little bit more sound deadening, the coil sprung chassis all the way around with the solid axles. I, I just felt like for North America, it was a little bit more of an appropriate vehicle. Um, so I kind of set out to, to cherry pick all the best components that I could from the globe a lot of the stuff came from australia because i was really lucky bringing the containers and max tracks over i could throw a bow desert exhaust in throw a g turbo in throw an hpd intercooler in and um what ended up kind of happening is i was able to just cherry pick and take the best pieces from everything and um you know i guess the land cruiser itself is cool but what we're really here to talk about is what's under the hood so the toyota 1hdt I, I guess you could probably call it the most reliable engine Toyota makes that you'd actually want to drive in a four-wheel drive. Um, it has a small turbo. It doesn't really run a huge amount of boost. Um, the engine as it sat um, pretty much remained stock all the way into the 100 series where it had almost twice the power. So where usually I didn't feel comfortable modifying um, the engine of an Overland vehicle with this, um, well, we just decided to give it a go. Um, so we started off with a great baseline. So rebuilt the injection pump, um, new injectors, uh, new seals on intake manifold, exhaust manifold, all new studs, all new bolts. Um, I wanted to make sure if we're gonna add pressure that we're not gonna have any leaks or anything like that. Um, so essentially at the heart of this engine, um, we have a G-Turbo Grunter. Now G-Turbo is this company from Australia and they, um, they basically take a factory housing that they have built to their specifications and they just use modern turbo technology. From 1991 to 2019 when I put this turbo in, um, a lot has changed in turbocharger technology. So we're benefiting from earlier boost, we're benefiting from slightly higher boost. Um, and then that air is getting cooled through a HPD um, intercooler that 
doesn't actually really add any complexity necessarily other than the fact that there is an intercooler. Um, it fits in a somewhat standard place. Um, it's pretty cool. I um, also put a Bow Desert turbo back exhaust on it. Um, a big, I, I guess if there's any problems we had with this car, it was chasing the, the EGTs. Um, the exhaust gas temperatures on these things are kind of crucial, especially with the automatic transmission. So some of these modifications were, I guess, you know, the cart before the horses. We added more power, well then we kind of created other problems that we had to fix that then created more power. So this thing will cruise 85, 90, 100 mile an hour if you really ask it to, um, which is pretty unique for a 100 series diesel vehicle. Um, you know, I guess when I was building this thing, um, you know, I was just starting my business and it was a bit of a therapy project for me, to be honest. Um, I was spending, you know, I was doing 80 hour weeks and this was just something that at the end of the day I could hop in the garage, complete a small little project, put a new grill on it, track down some little pieces from Japan or I was getting parts out of the Middle East for a while. Um, and I was really, what I was trying to do with this is I was trying to make a, as modern of a Land Cruiser as I can in an older style body that, you know, was loved and trusted and, and very durable. So um, it all came together pretty well. We've been lucky enough to take this thing to Moab like a dozen times. It's been all over the Southwest. We've had it down to the tip of Cabo. Well, we've had it to Cabo, the tip of Baja for, I think once or, no, we've had it down there twice. Um, we just, we love traveling in this thing. It's it doesn't draw a lot of attention, although the people, I guess, who know, know. Um, yeah, and, and, and again, being an Overland truck, we just, we focused on drivability. We focused on reliability. Um, we focused on how it would be to actually drive. Um, I went with a 34 inch tire versus a 35 inch tire. Um, it's just those little things added up to a lot of a lot of drivability. I didn't go with a three inch lift. I went with like a, maybe a two inch lift. I don't know what it actually ended up after everything settled. I'm gonna call it two inches. I did a lightweight TJM bumper because frankly, being the Max Tracks guy, I have all the Max Tracks I need. And I honestly, for how we use the vehicle, I didn't feel that I really needed a winch. So I didn't add that weight and that complexity. Um, but what I did do is I did things like this Wabasto diesel heater. So. Um, at the time we were living in Colorado, it was quite cold. These engines don't really like to start when they're cold. So I can press a button without being plugged in and a little diesel fired burner actually circulates coolant through the engine and through the cab. This is something I learned on the Expedition 7 trucks and it worked really well for them. Um, so I kind of tried to mimic that. Um, one thing that I haven't gotten to yet, but I would love to do is the ability to turn on that, that that fan switch on the inside to provide forced air heat, which would be, you know, an, I guess a project. But, um, you know, there's a lot of little details on this car that I spent quite a bit of time on, you know, finding the right heated fuel filter and figuring out the wiring for that. Um, realizing that I needed the US spec front brakes from the 80 series, they're a little bit larger. Um, realizing I needed a way to cool down the transmission realizing that I had moved to Phoenix, so the air conditioning wasn't as great. So I tracked down the Saudi spec or the JDM spec auxiliary fan, and I have that wired into my Switch Pro, and that's pretty cool. Um, but I guess the biggest modification that's on this thing is the Mulgo pop top. So let's go ahead and check that thing out. So one of the things I tried to pay you know, particular attention to on this vehicle is the details, like the Max Tracks that have the bronze teeth that match the bronze wheels. And, um, the little backup camera that we had installed. Just, you know, little things that I think um, don't necessarily detract from the vehicle um, as far as its originality, but like, I'll be honest, like I'm just used to, you know, I'm used to looking at a backup camera when I get in a vehicle these days, so that was nice to be able to add that. This thing's like 12 feet tall right now. I promise it's not actually this tall. So as you can see, actually setting up the pop top on this thing is super, super easy. Um, this was designed kind of to my spec, I guess. We sat down with, uh, with Daniel from Exhibition Center in Mulgo when I was in Sydney. 
had a few beers and sketched out on a napkin what I wanted. And then a few years later, this thing ended up coming to life, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, we're both pretty tall when we, you know, as travelers, we like to be comfortable. Um, so there's just some changes to this, this unit. Um, we can actually get out when another person is sleeping, the inside is on a hinge, like a hydraulic hinge, and it opens, but the back half actually has two individually removable panels. Um, so let's just hypothetically say I like to sleep in, because I do. Um, Laura can actually get out of the vehicle um, without having to wake me up, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, some of the other things we did is we did these MSA drawers. Um, we're a big fan of these. They're all aluminum, so it didn't really affect our payload a huge amount. That also kind of gave us a nice place to put this MSA drop slide, um, which is pretty cool when you uh, want a cold drink or something and uh, don't want to have to crawl all the way up in the truck. So the whole thing's kind of set up to, uh, you know, to be comfortable to live out of, comfortable to travel out of, but also comfortable on a on a day to day basis. So. I guess one of the big themes of this truck is trying to trying to be as comfortable as possible in an inconspicuous and compact package. So um, we did elect to, to go a little overkill on the suspension. So we did two and a half inch King uh, remote reservoir adjustable shocks. Um, and I just have to say when we're down in Baja and we're like running the road to San Juanico or something that has massive corrugations, those shocks have paid for themselves a million times over. Um, these Falcon Wild Peak tires have been fantastic. I tend to put them on all my cars now. Um, I love the fact that they're snowflake rated. Um, whatever they do with the compound of the tire is just magic. They work in a variety of, of, of terrain situations um, and they wear like iron. I mean, like these tires have been down, well, they've kind of been all over all over really. Um, did a Kmar bumper on the back and that was I guess kind of a, a, a nod to the heritage of the truck um, being that we import Australian products I wanted to use as many of those Australian products as I could and a Kmar just looks right I guess um, and along with that the Kmar really integrates nicely with the long-range automotive auxiliary fuel tank um, so we installed that with a factory Toyota uh, like diverter flapper valve um, so I can actually control which fuel is going into which tank. We have about 50 gallons in total, um, which gives us, you know, a, a pretty significant range. Um, you know, I, I do have to say that the diesel in America, since everybody lusts after it, it's the thing that you can't get. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there about it. Oh, well, I get 30 miles to the gallon. Oh, it, this thing will smoke a brand new power stroke. No, it's, it's, it's still pretty slow. The thing with the diesel is, you know, we really only saw, depending on how we were driving, 15 to maybe 20 miles to the gallon on, on a trip. And that's like where it's perfectly flat. There's no wind. Um, yeah, so, you know, in, in that regard, the diesel was a little bit of a challenge and honestly, even with the power mods that I have, I've got a, a good buddy, Jeff Yeager. He has a really, really similar truck, but he has a supercharged gas engine. And while he has to stop at every gas station he can think of, um, you know, his is still faster, which is maybe a little bit more fun if that's what you're into. But, um, you know, as far as a, you know, a, a simple fix it with a Leatherman Overland vehicle goes, for me, this was kind of my my perfect rendition of it. Um, you know, it's simple. I can fix this thing anywhere in the world. Um, you know, and it has that legendary 80 series durability.